Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Ephemeris Podcast. I'm your host, Ophelian, and uh, this is a show where we typically look at three articles a week uh, discussing some of the news in astronomy, and that is what we will be doing today. Um, I know that wasn't the plan of attack for the last episode, uh, just because I wanted to make things special, but we're back to uh, the usual, and... um, Yeah, uh, let's get this thing rolling. Today we will be looking at the universe's heaviest black hole binary and what it entails, the Compton camera, and an image taken by the dark energy camera, which I'm hoping will turn into the thumbnail for uh, today's uh, podcast episode. We'll see if that happens. So, first story, universe's heaviest black hole binary. So we have another story about black holes this season um, with the above mentioned title, but this time the two black holes that are a part of the act are not conventional. They're so huge that they refuse to merge and contain the mass of 28 billion suns together. If we haven't had enough uh, larger than life numbers on this podcast, there you go. There is another one. So what is 28 billion comparable to, you might ask, because, you know, the nature of this podcast is that we find some nice real-life analogies of these huge numbers to make sense of them. So you could say that 28 billion would equate to two suns for every year the universe has existed. And that's, like, quite mind-boggling if you give yourself enough time to think about it and digest it, Let's do one better. There are a hundred million blades of grass in an acre. So if the sun is one blade of grass, the two black holes we are talking about here combined are 280 acres of grass, which is just unbelievable. Just imagine taking one blade of grass and just zooming it out all the way to 280 acres of grass. That is insane. I like, when I did the research for this, um, I had to do a little bit of digging, but the moment I put two and two together for that, I was pretty shocked. So with this crazy number out of the way, let's talk about some other details. So the system is the most massive ever seen, which is quite obvious from what we just talked about. The two black holes are at the center of an elliptical galaxy, and it's called a, I think it's called a fossil galaxy, or something of the like. Um, This galaxy was the result of the merger uh, of two galaxies, which had two black holes at the center of it, but as the story says, the two black holes that were at the center of these galaxies that turned into this one fossil elliptical galaxy... They have not merged yet, and they're only separated by 24 light years, which is quite short for the scale of their masses. Um, So that's that. Uh, What's nice about this pair is that they are a visual binary, so they can actually be distinguished and sort of seen apart from each other if you have um, enough of a resolution on the image. And they have been in an orbital dance, as the article calls it, for the last 3 billion years. Just quite a long time. You'd definitely start to wonder, is it going to turn into a merger event? So, why do we care then? You know, it's nice to say, oh, that's a huge pair of black holes there. But it's also important to understand what this whole system means outside of that, because, you know, we can't get astonished about numbers, but... There should be some significance as well, otherwise it's kind of not worth our time to discuss it. So, we've never actually seen a black hole merger. That is the main idea that um, these two black holes could bring some closure to. Uh, The theory for a supermassive black hole merger is that um, it'll happen when galaxy collisions occur and... um, 
Following a galactic merger, supermassive black holes don't collide head on, instead they begin slingshotting past each other as they settle into a bound orbit. With each pass they make, energy is transferred from the black holes to the surrounding stars, and as they lose energy, the pair is dragged down closer and closer until they are just light years apart, which is kind of where the uh, black hole pair is right now, where gravitational radiation takes over and they merge. Um, so it's been observed in stellar mass black holes, but not supermassive ones, and definitely not of the cal like, definitely not in the caliber of where these um, two huge black holes are in. So yeah, there's a lot of potential for these pair of black holes to show us that uh, this is possible, but we're also considering whether black holes can be so massive that the whole process gets deadlocked. Because what we expect to see is what I just described above, you know, black holes emitting gravitational waves, carrying angular momentum away from the whole binary system, and then once you move closer and closer together, gravity takes over and boom, you have a merger. But with the pair that we see here, the mass of the system's two black holes is so great that the team, the team of astronomers on the um, on the issue, thinks it would take an exceptionally large population of stars around them to bring the supermassive black holes close together. As this has been happening, however, the energy leached from the binary has been flinging matter away from the vicinity, so making it harder and harder. This has left the center of the system bereft of stars and gas close enough to the binary to leach energy from it. As a result, the progress of these two supermassive black holes toward each other has stalled as they approach the final stages before a merger. So yeah, we're in this awkward limbo with these huge black holes and we don't know whether it's going to show us that it's like all other stellar mass mergers or if it's going to show us that supermassive black holes can be massive enough for them to like just never merge. So yeah, it's really up in the air. Um, some possibilities considered by the article. If they do merge, the resulting gravitational waves would be a hundred million times more powerful than those produced by stellar mass black hole mergers. It's possible the pair could conquer that final distance via another galaxy merger, which would inject the system with additional material or potentially a third black hole to slow the pair's orbit enough to merge. However, um, because it's like a fossil cluster, which is actually what the name is, um, I had that wrong. Um, because it's a fossil cluster, it's unlikely that um, another galactic merger will happen. So yeah, all in all, very much up in the air in terms of the fate of these two black holes. They are huge and um, perhaps they prove why it's so difficult to observe black hole mergers. So that is the end of our first article. Here we're going to get into an article that is in stark contrast to the last story and it's going to be about looking at the smallest physical structures, um, atoms, through a device called the Compton camera. So what the Compton camera is, is it's essentially a gamma ray detector. It uses what is known as Compton scattering to decipher the origin of observed gamma rays. Um, as described by the article, quote, Compton scattering happens when a high energy particle of light or photon bounces off a charged particle, usually an electron. This interaction forces the photons hitting the electrons to scatter meaning they transfer some of the energy and momentum to the particles they've just hit. In turn, those electrons can recoil and essentially pop off the atom they were previously attached to. This process can help reveal something about the atom that's involved, unquote. So, yeah, they're basically using the Compton effect to determine how the gamma rays that they're observing are oriented and where they come from, because, you know, Compton scattering is an effect where you have like momentous collisions and um, that can provide some clues as to what's going on with the atom that was involved. So um, also let it be known that the Compton process is common among mid-energy phenomena, which is the target for Compton cameras. So 
They observe phenomena at energy levels from hundreds to kilo or hundreds of kilo electron volts to several mega electron volts. That's basically what the above statement means, or the previous statement. Um, with this information, you might think that the Compton camera's greatest application is in astrophysics. However, our story here suggests otherwise. Uh, it says, quote, by capturing the polarization of gamma rays emitted from atomic nuclei rather than faraway galactic objects, the Compton camera managed to reveal the internal structure of the atomic nucleus as well as any changes such nuclei may be undergoing. So this is the central idea of our article on the Compton camera here today. And um, the Compton camera might be more versatile than we think as it provides lots of value to nuclear physics and spectroscopy. So let's sink our teeth into this idea because um, it's a very ab abbreviated statement about what the article actually talks about and how exactly you can reveal the internal structure of the atomic nucleus. So, if you've taken your fair share of physical science classes, physics, chemistry, you're familiar with atomic structures. Uh, you have a nucleus with protons and neutrons, and outer shells of electrons with valence shells and electrons being the most out there, right? Using neutrons, there are many isotopes that can be created of each element, and an element always has the same number of protons and electrons, provided it's not ionized, right? If it's ionized, then maybe not the same uh, number of electrons. Most isotope forms of an element are unstable, and the unstable isotopes are where some of the more interesting nuclear processes occur, like, you know, radioactive decay and such which I'll uh, define in just a moment. So understanding the unique nuclear processes of unstable isotopes is an area of great mystery to scientists at the moment. Um, unstable isotopes have unusual electron energy levels, and we have not fully understood the nuclear structures that create them. And here's where the Compton camera comes in handy. So Compton cameras can actually detect the emission of gamma rays from radioactive decay processes. If you don't know what radioactive decay is, it's essentially an atom getting rid of some protons or neutrons to turn into a more stable atom or isotope. So the article uh, states here, uh, the researchers believe the Compton camera, which includes something called a cadmium telluride semiconductor imaging sensor, could be ideal for measuring the polarization of gamma rays from unstable nuclei. Again, this is because such a sensor offers high detection efficiency and precise accuracy when determining the position of gamma rays, even though it was initially meant for deep space gamma ray signals. The article continues, quote, the polarization of photons from charged particles turns unpolarized light into polarized light with the orientation of polarization arising as a result of the scattering angle. The Compton camera can precisely measure the scattering angle and the polarization of these gamma rays, which indicates properties of particles within the atom, such as the value of quantum mechanical characteristics called spin and parity." Unquote. So, yeah, that's the essence of how Com the Compton camera can basically be like, okay, we observe this Compton scattering effect, and um, we can precisely trace back the scattering angle, which will allow us to um, look at really, really tiny details about the atoms that this emission is coming from, like um, the spin of the electrons, which um, you may be familiar with if um, you did a little bit of atomic chemistry um, in the past, but perhaps you're not. In that case, it's fine. You just need to know that it's a minute but key detail about um, the atomic structure of any atom, really. So with this new ability of the common Compton camera discovered and unlocked, a team of researchers used it for tests that, quote, involved blasting a film of iron nuclei with a beam of protons. This caused the electrons in the 
thin iron film to reach an excited state and emit gamma rays as they returned to their ground state. The team controlled both the position and intensity of these emissions artificially. This allowed for a detailed analysis of scattering events. The article continues, the emitted gamma rays were measured, revealing a peak structure, and the team was able to determine the angle at which photons were scattered. The team expected their results could be crucial for investigating the structure of rare radioactive nuclei, but even the lead researcher was surprised by how successful this test was. So, yeah, um, the Compton camera's ability is really blowing away some of the researchers here. Um because of the details that they're able to pull away from a simple test such as shooting protons at um, iron nuclei, which kind of reminds me of the um, gold foil experiment. I think it's Rutherford that did that, but uh, don't quote me on that because I'm a little bit poor on my history of chemistry knowledge. I learned it like a couple years back, but I don't remember it quite that well. So, it looks like we've only seen the tip of the iceberg for what a Compton camera can actually do, and it's a very interesting instrument indeed, and I thought it was nice to be able to talk about that here today. Uh, it had us, it, it was a bit more of a deviation from our typical astrophysics talk and discussion, but um, I thought it was cool, so I wanted to bring it up because it has that little connection to astrophysics with the detection of gamma rays. So, our last article that we're going to talk about here is the dark energy camera capturing a record-breaking image of a dead star scattered remains. So uh, the image was of the Vela supernova remnant, and um, the dark energy camera is specifically mounted on the Victor M. Blanco 4-meter telescope at the uh, Cerotololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. I apologize if I did not. Um, the intended purpose of the dark energy camera that captured um, the image we're going to describe in a moment, um, its original intent was, or intent, intended purpose, um, was to, as the name suggests, measure the strength of dark energy and see its effect on the universe's expansion because that's come about in recent theory and a great way to understand why um, dark energy is so important is to go back to the last episode where we talked a little bit about it. So that was the intended purpose of the camera, but it actually found a new purpose as a powerful wide field instrument. And um, the image it took of the Vela Supernova remnant just shows this because it the image is an astounding 1.3 gigapixels in size, which honestly, large number, I'm not going to get into it, all right? It's a huge number. Just take it as you will. I'm not going to do too much breaking down of large numbers here. I think we've done enough of that on uh, this episode. But um, yeah, again, record-breaking size, 1.3 gigapixels. Um, but I will give a brief description of the image here in the case that I, for some reason, don't um, use it as the thumbnail for this episode. So, basically in the image, what we have is some stunning and bright hues creating a bubble shape in the middle of the image. Uh, there are blue strips of gas extending from the center of the image to the top third of the image, both left and right. Uh, the red extends into the background of the image and gives a warm feel while or complementing the golden yellow that stands out in the middle of the image. And the red um, also contrasts the blue quite well. It's a really, really nice image. And um, yeah, uh, other than that, there are stars that scatter the more empty space in the image as well. It gives a nice touch. So... In the 1.3 gigapixels that this image contains, it captures... Wait, hold on. I think I wrote that incorrectly in my notes. Um, basically, within the 1.3 gigapixels that this image contains, um, it uh, captures an 
supernova remnant that is 100 light years across and only 800 light years away from us. So it's getting a huge range of data and very detailed at that. Um, the veil of supernova remnant spans an area on the celestial sphere 20 times larger than the angular diameter of the full moon, which tells you just how large this supernova remnant is and what we can really get out of looking into it um, very deeply. So with that in mind, um, getting a detailed observation of the veil of supernova remnant has provided us with more detail as to how uh, the remnant will develop later in life. Uh, it's offered insight into how um, material blown out by the supernova gradually disperses into the interstellar medium, to quote the article. Um, another quote here that talks um, a little bit about this veil of supernova remnant and what we can see from it. Quote, the shockwave from the in ancient stellar explosion that form the veil of supernova remnant is still expanding into space where it is colliding with the interstellar medium and compressing it creating the delicate filaments we can see in the image absorption lines from elements like calcium carbon copper germanium krypton magnesium nickel oxygen and silicon many of them ionized and doubly ionized have been detected in the supernova debris as well these are heavy elements forged either by uh, fusion processes within the star before it exploded or by the ferocious energies released by the explosion itself. So very complex and heavy elements. Um, the origin of those is very important to us when we're studying um, astronomy and stellar astronomy. So this is a really important um, part of the sky to look into um, for that reason. And um, looking into the Veil of Supernova Remnant in detail also tells us about the Vela Pulsar that was left behind after the explosion and the nebula that it has created, which is a Pulsar Wind Nebula. If you'll remember, we've talked about that before on this um, episode. I'm not going to provide a full um, rundown of what Pulsar Wind Nebulas do, but if you tuned into the podcast episode where we did talk about one of them, you'll note that they're very interesting um, in their magnetic and um, just physical features. So yeah, that's all I got to talk about in terms of um, this amazing image that was taken of the Vela supernova remnant and the episode at large. So that is the end of this podcast episode. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the podcast episode. If you're still here, um, if you all enjoyed listening to this episode and you'd like to hear more, um, make sure to follow me on Spotify. And if you're on YouTube, uh, make sure to hit that subscribe button and also make sure that your notifications are on all because YouTube is not very good at recommending my content to returning viewers. So yeah, that is all I've got for this episode. And until next week, I will see you all later. Peace.